Society. And my name is Shay Cody. I'm the president of the Society. And uh, I would encourage anybody who is here today who isn't a member of the Society to consider joining us. And you can do so by uh, just logging on to IrishLaborHistorySociety.com and there's a facility to join. And um, one of the benefits of membership is your copy of Sayer, which is our annual, uh, very highly regarded uh, journal that's uh, well into its uh, 40s at this stage uh, in, in annual uh, copies. Um, Mary Muldowney, who's going to speak to us today about the struggle for equality uh, amongst the telephonist um, a community in um, the Department of Post and Telegraphs uh, uh, is uh, one of Dublin City Council's uh, excellent uh, network of historians. Uh, Mary is also um, a mem committee member of the Irish Labour History Society. And just to confuse everybody, Mary is usually the host of uh, these talks, uh, but because she's uh, given the talk today, uh, our colleague Kevin Murphy has become Mary Muldowney and Mary Muldowney has become Theon Muldowney. Uh, but we'll be probably back to normal for the last of our talks next week when Mike Meacham will discuss Keir Hardy in Ireland. Um, the um, format here is Mary will take us through uh, her presentation. Uh, during that, I would ask uh, everybody to mute and stop their video so that uh, the screen is as kind of simple and clear as uh, possible. At the end, um, there will be a Q&A opportunity and I would encourage people to either ask questions or make comments via the chat button at the bottom of your screen. So with that, uh, I again, thank you all for um, visiting today's uh, talk and uh, over to Mary to kick off. Thanks, Shay. Um, and uh, anybody who comes in late is going to be very confused, but um, uh, sorry, just I'm going to actually switch the video because um, it's just showing you, which is even more confusing. Um, okay, uh, I this is actually a shortened version of a paper that is going to be in the next edition of Seher, which Shay just mentioned, uh, which I'm very pleased about. Um, it's the one in uh, Seher 46 will be a good bit longer, but the paper and the research is based on interviews I did a few years ago with people who had been involved with the telephonists, and I was very pleased to see there Margaret Corsi because I'm going to talk about her a bit, um, and uh, there were I've also interviewed male telephonists, but for today, and because of the day that's in it on Monday, um, I'm focusing on mainly the women's struggle. So it has been frequently claimed that the European Union gave us equality, and certainly it has helped to have equal pay and equal treatment directives. But it was mainly women workers who forced successive employers and governments to introduce change in the conditions they encountered. Now, these are by no means all women workers, but of course, you all, if not personally remember, but will have heard of the laundry strike, the famous women, Don's women and one man, uh, the women's liberation movement. And of course, what you see here is um, the nurses strike uh, about gosh, 20 years ago now. Anyway, uh, these are all just examples of the sort of uh, action that women have been more than willing to take in uh, demanding equality for themselves and for fellow workers. And as with the uh, laundry strike, of course, it had enormous benefits when they won for workers, male and female, throughout the country. So if women didn't find that the industrial relations procedures actually delivered for them, they were ready to take to the streets. And in the paper, I will be referring to my interviews, as I said, well, with some of them and some men who told me about their own involvement in the struggle for better pay and conditions. 
I'm particularly grateful to Harry Owens, whom many of you I'm sure will know, uh, because he gave me introductions to many of the interviewees and he's been sharing his own recollections of being a shop steward in the 1970s with me. Um, I'm afraid between COVID and life and my job, which is often quite busy, um, I've had to be to drop the project to some extent for the last couple of years, but I have every intention of getting back to it. And, um, you know, unfortunately, it's a historian's life, but you're often working on about four or five different research projects at one time. So female union members were not alone in demanding equal rights. The Irish Women's Liberation Movement published Change or Change in 1971, demanding equal pay for women, equality before the law, equality in education, availability of contraception, justice for deserted wives, single mothers and widows, and a house for every family. And we haven't actually delivered on all of those yet. However, um, in 1975, an offshoot of the women's liberation movement, Irish Women United, was founded by a group of particularly politicised women, and they spent the next few years generating publicity for the demands, with protests and pickets especially, in what has been categorised as a period of high energy and radical action for the women's movement. In that period, there were record numbers of working days lost to strike action in both public and private sector employments. And uh, this reflected a period of industrial militancy during the 1970s. The top here, you can see, obviously, the Post Office Workers' Union. Sorry, it's a bit pixelated, but I was trying to get them nice and neat. Um, housing action, uh, the bin strike, and I can't remember the exact mid, uh, year, I think it was 74, but the middle of the uh, 70s when um, they were looking for parity. And uh, over here we have the McDonald's <coughs> drive where a lot of very young workers were particularly involved. But uh, the civil service and the public sector organizations certainly experienced their own share of disputes at this time, both official and unofficial. The Department of Posts and Telegraphs, which was the telephonist employer, came high in the league of public sector organizations that were, as uh, it was described during the time, prone to strikes, as if it was something that was accidental. And they were actually second only to CIE in those years in the 70s, with a total of 33 formally recognized strikes in that decade. These were of a fairly large scale and, of course, include the 18 week strike by post office workers in 1979. There were two unions representing uh, female and male telephonists in 1970. The Post Office Workers Union, the POWU, and the Post Office Officials Association, the uh, PWOA. The POWU had a formal recognition agreement with the Department of Posts and Telegraphs, and it was tied into a formal industrial relations system called the Civil Service Conciliation and Arbitration Board, uh, which had been set up in 1950. The PWA did not have a recognition agreement with management, and it was considerably smaller in membership numbers, though uh, frequently just as militant, certainly, in its approach. In 1970, over 1,100 of the women in the Dublin Exchange were POWU members, and it was reasonable to expect that the union would take their interests seriously. Sheila Dowling, whom you see in the middle of all the boys here, um, was actually the only woman on the union's executive committee, despite the numbers of female members, for a very long time. Uh, this picture, I think, was taken in yeah, 1963, and she was still there in the 70s, uh, all on her own. Although there were very, women, uh, very active women uh, throughout the various branches of the union. Terry Quinlan had been appointed General Secretary in 1970, 
and he played an important role in pursuing the women's concerns, giving them significant support on foot of the equal pay claim that was carried on between 1973 and 1979. And I should say too that in addition to my own um, oral history research and documentary and archival research, uh, I found uh, Francis Devine's excellent history communicating the union um, uh, really for of the various manifestations of the post office workers union and then turning into the communication workers union these days uh, extremely helpful and of course with France's usual scrupulous attention to detail. Sorry. Usually the women telephonists were uh, recruited straight from school and most of them would have had little or no workplace experience. Margaret de Courcy came from Waterford, where she'd been working as a stock control clerk. She was 19 when she joined the Coastal Service. At the time, sorry, uh, that would have been 1974, they would take in, in the Central Telephone Exchange in Dublin, which was based in Exchequer Street, they would take a couple of hundred girls in, uh, worked by day, and the normal recruitment age was 18, uh, sorry, the girls were, they were women, but they called them girls, <laughs> uh, and they worked by day, and the normal recruitment age was 18 to 20, stroke 21. It was very rarely that you got someone over 21. The recruitment process happened twice a year and they took in a couple of hundred people each time. Madeline Burkery had been in boarding school and her mother made the application for her to join the Department of Post and Telegraphs. Madeline's mother had done the same thing for her older siblings when they finished school. I did the leaving cert in June and the following September I started in the telephone exchange. My sister was in Dublin the year before me. All us country girls always stayed together and we always networked like that, like the traditional Irish. All of us stayed around the circular road. After uh, her few years in the uh, telephone exchange, Madeline emigrated to Australia and that's where I spoke to her. So um, this picture is from our Skype in conversation, but she's still very active in uh, union work in Australia and with various other volunteer projects. So in 1970, the wage scale for a female telephonist was roughly 10 to 16 pounds per week. According to an advertisement to fill 50 vacancies in the Department of Posts and Telegraphs, the fringe benefits included a marriage gratuity, good holidays, free medical attendance and promotion prospects. The marriage gratuity was paid to women who had to leave their jobs when they were getting married and was supposedly compensation for their exclusion from promotion and pension rights because of the marriage bar. The ban on married women in civil and public service employment was still operative until it was removed in July 1973 and foot of a recommendation from the first commission on the status of women. <coughs> Excuse me. The marriage bar in the private sector wasn't finally abolished until 1977 when the Employment Equality Act uh, made it unlawful to discriminate on the grounds of sex or marital status. Since the amount payable in the marriage gratuity was calculated on one month's pay per, per year of service, and this was capped at a maximum of one year's salary, it was particularly disadvantageous for younger women as recipients of the gratuity only qualified after they'd been five years employed in the civil service or the public service in this case. In 1972, the department suggested employing married women as part-time telephonists, even though the marriage ban hadn't been lifted at that stage. They wanted them in the Dublin Central Exchange and a circular set out the department's proposal as follows. 
So the department is prepared to re-employ a number of former telephonists who resigned on marriage for part-time work during the period 5 p.m. to 11.30 p.m. on weekdays. Actual attendances would be settled with each individual, but the intention is that they would be employed for fixed hours, not less than four hours per night, on fixed nights of the week to make a minimum of 18 hours per week. The rates of pay would be as follows. So under 21 years of age would get uh, 36. I was thinking cent, but actually that would be pence because it was before the euro. So it's um, decimalized, but not uh, the euro. So 36 um, pence per hour. At 21 years of age, it went up to the princely sum of 40 pence. And then at 25 or over was 45 pence per hour. If the person's interested should write to the exchange manager, indicating the attendance they would be prepared to give. Now, the bit in red is the information I got about the rate for male night telephonists at this time. Uh, and it was in excess of the payment proposed for women who would be doing exactly the same job. So a man would get 50 pence an hour if he was under 21. Over 21, or at least at 21, would get 53 pence an hour. And at 24 years, a, a year younger than the women uh, and over, would qualify for 58 pence an hour. So the weekly rate worked out considerably better. The maximum point on an incremental scale was set at £26.55 for full-time and part-time male workers, whereas there were no increments outlined for the female part-time staff. Male members of the PWA who were working from 5pm to 8am complained about the employment of women on the earlier part of the night shift. The men were not objecting to the employment of women per se. They wanted to be certain that the women were being asked to work the same hours um, and at the same rate of pay as the men, so that the department would not get away with extending part-time work at rates that would undermine terms and conditions for the previously all-male night shift workers. So, a couple of years later, immediately following on from the removal of the marriage bar in 1973, the POWU took up the question of maternity leave, since women would now be entitled to continue in their jobs after marriage and were likely to get pregnant. An agreement on the conditions for maternity leave was published in September 1974. Other successful claims were made by the union around this time, including securing a reduction in the height requirement for telephonists, which had previously excluded some women. Dorothy Prendergast recalled that initially you joined the telephone exchange and there was a height requirement because they had the old plug-in board, so you had to be able to reach the top line. We used to laugh because there was a girl working there who was shorter than I am, and I'm quite short, and I asked her how she ever passed the height test. But once you stood up, you had high stools, a bit like bar stools, you can see them here. And if you stood up on the randy bit, you could reach the top. And the London lines were all on the top. So whether that was prejudice or um, simply because they wouldn't be used so frequently, I don't know. Outlets for promotion for women were limited, even without the marriage bar. Dorothy started work in the Central Telephone Exchange after her recruitment as a telephonist. She was there for about six months when she was successful in her application to transfer to the International Exchange because she spoke excellent French. She could have spent her working life there, but she wanted to be promoted. Because she had initially been recruited as a telephonist, if she wanted to be appointed to a supervisory position, she had to move back to the larger exchange because the international exchange had a limited number of personnel and less likelihood of promotional opportunities. When telephonists were brought into the central telephone exchange, the CTE, in Dublin, 
They were given several weeks training in the use of the switchboards and the various protocols attached to their jobs. The constant monitoring was an intrinsic part of the CTE procedures that was remembered by several of the people who spoke to me. Harry Owens, as I said, was a night telephonist, and he described the oppressive atmosphere, which applied to the female day telephonists as well as the night workers. The normal way of dealing with everything in the civil service, we discovered, was if they didn't get a verbal answer, they wrote you a paper and you had to reply on the same sheet. And that meant later when they queried you, you didn't have a copy of what they'd said or you'd said. They listened in to operators secretly. Um, and it, it was actually called the observation room. But uh, that's so when he's talking about down below, that was the observation room. And then wrote down everything you said. You might be called up two weeks later and told on this day you took that call and um, they, sorry, and you used a non-standard expression. There were standard expressions for everything and you were only supposed to use them. Now they mightn't object to a bit of quiet chit chat, but if there was anything more than that, you could be deferred for promotion or warned or disciplined. Supervisors were present all the time in the switch rooms, so the observation that went on was quite overt. The next grade up from the operators was class two supervisor, and there were usually eight to 10 of them present in each switch room, depending on its size. Then there were two class one supervisors whose job was to watch the class twos to make sure they were watching the operators. The age profile obviously increased as seniority and rank was achieved. Because the marriage bar had been in place until 73, most of the senior women would not have married and were usually in their 40s or 50s. The chief supervisor oversaw this structure, which was an all-female hierarchy, but the management roles, the exchange manager and the people who ran such departments as engineering, observations and wages were all men. Margaret had joined the POWU in 1974. And as soon as her probation ended, she became very active uh, representing the interests of younger members of staff like herself. By this time, um, Eileen Walsh had joined Sheila Dowling as a member of the executive BOWU and she urged Margaret to collect as much information as possible about the nature of the difficulties faced by the members. And this would allow them to deal properly with management's obfuscation. So one of the first issues that I got involved in was local conditions and issues to do with them. The equipment we worked with, and every time we made a complaint, they kept selling, saying, tell us where the problem is. Now, what it meant was that somebody had to go into a switch room and spend five hours going around from board to board to board and recognize all the problems there and write the list. I came in one day on my day off and I did that. We went over my first delegation. The first meeting was on all this stuff and they nearly dropped their drawers, the management, when they saw all this stuff. Margaret was seconded from her telephonist job for a year to become a full-time branch secretary. And she became embroiled in several disputes with successful outcomes for the members. She believes that part of her strength at the time was the support she got from Eileen Walsh and Terry Quinlan, who backed her in the POWU executive meetings, where there was not always wholehearted enthusiasm for the women's issues. The belief that the women were, I quote, temporary members because they were expected to get married and leave their jobs undermined the potential force of their numbers in the union. So in the early 1970s, pay discrimination between women and men was institutionalized in both the public and private sectors. The Labour Fine Gael coalition government introduced the Employment Equal Pay Bill in 1973, but they claimed that they couldn't enact it because it would cost too much. 
the appeal is the Equal Pay Directive that came from the EU in 1975, but we're told that they would have to pass the Anti-Discrimination Pay Act 1974, which the Minister for Finance had tried to defer until 77. RTE's seven days programme at the time marks the introduction of equal pay with a report shown on 11th of July 1975. They found that in the civil service and the public service, the gap between male and female rates, pay rates had actually increased in the previous five years, despite the directive from the EU. In 1969, the difference between the all-female grade called clerical assistants and the marriage differentiated scale called clerical officers was only five pounds. Yet due to national wage agreements and with the progress towards equal pay of the clerical officers, there was no similar progress towards equal pay in the all-female grade, with the result that on the 1st of June 1975, the difference between the all-female grade and the clerical officers was now £16. So one of the first formal investigations under the new legislation was instigated by the POWU on behalf of its female members. In his report on the investigation, the Irish Independent Industrial Correspondent, sorry, somebody... Uh, as there's a lot of noise, could, could maybe shut off the sound on their uh, screen, please. Um, so the, industri the Irish Independence Industrial Correspondent, John Devine, referred to the women as hello girls. Uh, he wrote about their opportunity to woo the Equal Pay Commissioner, John Ormar, round to their way of thinking. Although later in his report, he noted that the claim was probably one of the most historic in the whole public service. Um, that kind of language was unfortunately very typical of the time where women just weren't taken seriously, especially by certain journalists. The claim coincided with the call from the Federated Union of Employers, the FUE, for a postponement of the implementation of the equal pay legislation. Although, although the women could demonstrate that they were doing the same work and work of equal value with their male colleagues, Mar reject their pay, rejected their pay demand on both grounds. 1975 was International Women's Year, and the POWU noted that the post office had issued a stamp, very nice it is, to commemorate the year, but continued to resist equal pay for the largest group of women in the post office and civil service, the telephonists and clerical assistants. The telephonists equal pay claim submitted by the POWU in 1973 compared their position with that of the male night telephonists. The men's basic pay was higher and they also got an allowance for working on social hours at night. The Equal Pay Commissioner determined that the, equal, the actual work of telephonists and male night telephonists was the same, but the men's work was more onerous because of the night work. His ruling completely ignored the fact that the women weren't allowed to apply for night telephonous jobs because of the 1936 Conditions of Employment Act, uh, although that provision was eventually changed a few years later in 78. But at the time, Jim Farrelly reported in the Irish Independent on the change in the law in 1978 and again, thinking he was smart with his Hello Girls, had the headline, Hello Girls Will Be Working in the Dark. The 1500 Hello Girls in the Central Telephone Exchange Dublin have won a major battle in their campaign for sex equality. For tomorrow, the first female will report for night to Lefina's duty, which traditionally has been the preserve of 400 males. She is Marianne Kearney from Longford, and she has got the job under the new anti-discrimination legislation, which prohibits sex bars in the public service. 
I have to say I misread that first, uh, but um, it, it is, uh, <laughs> I think they probably meant to sex bands, <laughs> maybe not. Um, sorry, I digress. Uh, the move means that for the first time, a woman will be eligible for the £10 special allowance for night duty. That, coupled with the Sunday shift allowance, involves an extra £18 by way of weekly allowances on top of basic wages. In order to make way for Marianne's entry into the night roster, the traditional post of male night telephonist has been abolished. Now, I don't know if it's my um, cynical view of what he's writing there, but I didn't really, you know, while the post certainly was abolished, it wasn't about Marianne, it was about generating some equality but um you know as i said i have a 21st century perspective on this so the pow continued to pursue the fight for equal pay the union's argument got short shrift in a lengthy editorial in the irish independent which stated that removing discrimination against women in the matter of wages would be disastrous for the irish economy and would contribute to an inflationary spiral and put more out of work. So yet again, the women were to blame. The POWU held an equal pay telephonist symposium in October, 1976, which had its biggest ever attendance of female members. The largest delegation was from the Dublin telephone section and the average age of the delegates was early to mid twenties. In March 1977, four of those women, including Margaret de Courcy, approached the POWU executive and got authorization and a promise of support for several two-day two strikes in the Dublin exchanges. Their intention was to draw maximum public attention to the way they were being treated without totally crippling the telephone service. The strike action began with the women withdrawing from the International Exchange on Monday 7th of March and shutting down the Central Exchange on the following two days. They resumed normal service on Thursday and Friday, but announced that they would resume the strike on the following Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. The department management retaliated by withholding their pay from the women who worked in the International Exchange claiming that the shortage of staff was responsible. A statement from the Dublin Mail Night Telephonist branch of the union condemned the department's deliberate attempt to divide the telephone operating staff by paying wages to male night staff while pleading inability to pay their female colleagues their wages. The branch also challenged the statement from the Department of Post and Telegraphs saying that male and female telephonists were not paid the same basic rate in the British Post Office <coughs> when the union pointed out that it was well known that equal pay had been paid there since 1975. Writing in the Irish Times on August 20th, 1976, journalist Mary Marr, incidentally a member of both uh, the Irish Women's Liberation Movement and Irish Women United, uh, said that the department's obstructive approach amounted to subterfuge. And she said, few women will believe any longer than they have any option other than industrial action. She argued that it had been apparent all along that the machinery of equality was faulty and appears to have been constructed for sabotage. One of the notable aspects of the press coverage of the various industrial actions conducted by the tele telephonists was the involvement of female journalists who reported extensively on the way the women were being treated. Um, journalists like Mary Marr and Christina Murphy covered the picket sympathetically, often framing the women's actions in the context of feminist arguments. This cooperation and support were emblematic not only of women trade unions, but also of other radical movements in which women were involved in the 1970s and indeed in later decades. In his History of the Irish Times, Terence Brown described the newspaper as the house journal of the Irish women's liberation movement. 
The journalist's reports elicited a lot of public sympathy for the telephonists because it meant that the conditions they were fighting were being revealed to people outside the exchanges. Finally, on February the 5th, 1979, a Labour Court Equality Officer ruled that the Department of Posts and Telegraphs had not established that the male night telephonists' higher pay rates were justified, and the women day telephonists were entitled to the same basic pay rates as the men. The claim had been ongoing for years, but after nearly 10 years of campaigning, actually only about 20% of the 3,200 mostly senior telephonists would actually qualify for increased pay. Margaret recalled that 1,100 women from the Central Exchange branch of the POWU walked out onto the streets of Dublin on a few occasions in pursuit of the equal pay rates and the back pay that was owed to them because of the department's delays. They believed it was the only way to achieve justice for themselves. Their last protest on the issue was in January 1979. We needed to take them out on the equal pay issue just as a demonstration. So we called a meeting at three o'clock. At the time, the Women Workers Union was in Fleet Street and I rang them up and said, can I book a room? This is the building, but obviously they're a long time gone since the union amalgamated with zip to in 84. But you can see that I suppose you could say it's an appropriate um, office for amnesty. Uh, I don't know if they, they used to have the bottom part as well, but I see there's a barber shop there in the photograph. Anyway, um, she said at the time they were in Fleet Street and I rang them up and said, can I book a room? And it fit 50 people and I was taking 1100 out. So they came from Marlborough Street and they came from Exchequer Street and Dane Court and Abbey Street. And they all made their way there to have somewhere to go and you could see them when I arrived down. They were up the stairs and I could hear a voice. We can't fit any more in, get out. The organization might have been chaotic, but the description of the women coming from all over the city center to attend the meeting and insist on their rights is a telling illustration of their fighting spirit. The Department of Posts and Telegraphs finally made the equal pay settlement in February 1979. Several of the interviewees remarked in the fairly widespread belief at the time that when the wider strike began within a week of that payment, that the department and indeed some of the union executive support the male lower income strike for a long overdue pay rise. That turned out to be a very wrong assessment. The telephonists went out en masse and remained out for the full duration of the strike. They inspired other women working for the Department of Posts and Telegraphs to follow their example in later years, like Joan who started her job in the Postal Service and joined the union in 1980. She said, when I joined, it was just after the strike. There was very much a change environment in the workplace. They were very confident they had gone out. They were pissed off that they were out for 18 weeks or whatever, but they were coming back in stronger, negotiating in that. We were the first layer of women that actually worked down in Sheriff Street on shift work because they got the equal pay. A lot of the women, actually most of the women that came in around that time, all eventually got active in the union or the, over the four to five to six years they were working in the place. They were really strong women as well, because they had to be. Well, thank you for listening. And uh, I've actually come in on time or slightly under it, which is an unusual one for me. So I'll stop sharing. Shay, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, Mary, I'd like to thank you on behalf of everybody listening in on a great uh, account of the struggle in the 1970s, bringing back memories, uh, I'm quite sure, to some, uh, and highlighting, I suppose, the importance of the struggle to break out of the kind of 
you know, male breadwinner worldview that was predominant, uh, not just in the public service, but right, right across the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I suppose one of the first points that comes up is obviously the struggle of uh, women for equal pay didn't just exist in the Department of Post and Telegraphs. No. Um, for example, in local government, uh, Evelyn Owens, who uh, ended up chair of the Labour Court, had first cut her teeth in um, threatening a breakaway female union from the local government uh, union over an arbitration award that brought in differentiated pay between men and women. So, you know, and that was earlier on in the 60s. So I suppose the first point around this is, uh, while that story that you describe in the Department of Post and Telegraphs is obviously a huge headline, were there links with similar struggles elsewhere, either in the public service or the private sector? Oh yeah, there was a lot of uh, tic-tacking back and forth and people discussing what had been successful as a tactic and what strategies might be adopted. Um, it, it was a, a time, as I said, a fairly strong industrial militancy, but uh, it was, I think, too, a time of women emerging and the women's movement had a lot to do with that. So um, that's where the information would have come from in many cases, you know, as to how you might pursue things. But, you know, I can see Margaret de Courcy there <laughs> off in the corner uh, and I'm very pleased I am to see her. But, you know, uh, women like that who were starting to get positions in the unions, not just the POWU, but other unions uh, were making a difference. And of course, I mean, while Evelyn, Evelyn Owen stands out as quite a remarkable,